Uh, beginning text is Mark 22, 22. Though it is up on the board, if you'd rather use that. Mother asks, do you remember what we did last week for the children's lesson? I don't remember what I did this morning. Will you find your place? Please stand. <coughs> That's about it, Grant. Oh, my God. What is it? There's only 16 chapters in the Kabar. You can try, though. <laughs> but go ahead. It's Mark 16, isn't it? Turn next to Elijah 25. And the wrath of God smite you. <laughs> no, it's not. Mark 16 is a half point each person. I'm sure it does. <laughs> <laughs> it's always mine though, so I think it's Matthew. Alright. Oh, wait. Anyways. Mark, it's in there. <laughs> Mark something, 22. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it and gave to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Pastor, could you bless the servant? Father, we love you this morning. We just count it a privilege to be in your house this morning to worship you and to hear your word. And I just pray, Lord, for your anointing and for your direction for John this morning as he brings forth your word. Just let uh, your perfect will be done, and we know your word is going to bless us, each and every one. And we just pray and ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. As Pastor said, the two of us are preaching a series of messages leading up to Easter. And this morning I am preaching on the final supper <coughs> of Jesus Christ and his disciples. This is probably the best known scene from this set of scripture. Uh, probably thanks in large part to the painting based off of it that is very famous as well. Um, but I want to go back and start a bit earlier with the story than this in a scripture that actually exists. <laughs> Matthew 16 and 21, from that time, f no, Matthew 26 and 17. Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. So this is not too long after Jesus has entered Jerusalem, the famous story of him riding on a donkey, and he's seeking a room to eat the Passover with his disciples in. Um, and this is something of a callback to his entry into Jerusalem. In that case, he told his disciples to go before me into the city. You will find such and such a man with such and such a donkey, and that will be my steed. Uh, trust me on this, guys. And he does the same thing here again, telling his disciples to go find a particular man and just ask him, and he'll give us the room we need. I, On the surface, this is pretty random. There doesn't appear to be much difference between Jesus doing this and Jesus calling forwards for hotel reservations. But I don't think this is just him showing off. I don't think that this is, hey guys, I can see the future, it's kind of neat. I do believe there is a purpose to that. Um, after all, Christ was a very purposeful man. He lived a majority of his life in a very specific manner just to fulfill centuries old prophecy. So I don't believe he does very many things randomly or with coincidence. So the disciples, of course, go into town. They find this specific man who lends him, them the use of his upper room. And they gather for the Jewish tradition of Passover. Verse 21, same chapter. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. It is one of you guys. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? 
He said unto him, Thou hast said. So, just a couple reminders of the general themes uh, that all lead up to the crucifixion. Once again, Jesus knows exactly what's going on. He is doing this on purpose. Um, uh, the Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. But as Pastor suggested a couple weeks ago, I don't think it was... It was definitely God's ultimate and perfect plan that Jesus died for us on the cross, but I don't think it was that Judas uh, betrayed him. I believe this is a genuine treachery on the part of a friend of Jesus's. Um, the Bible specifically says that all the apostles were very sorrowful when Jesus told them that there was a traitor amongst them. I get the feeling that the apostles were a very close-knit group of friends, that they not only were united in their love and following of Jesus and his teaching, but that they were also pretty close on a personal basis. And they don't like the idea that any of them could betray their Savior. Um, in fact, they're so slow to acknowledge this that they never really do. I believe it's in the book of John, though I won't quote any addresses this morning, um, <laughs> that Jesus literally points to Judas, says, this is the guy, go and betray me now. And all the other apostles go, huh, well, he must be running an errand for Jesus. He literally said exactly what was going on, and the apostles didn't get it. Well, 11 of them did it. I wonder if, and this is purely speculation on my part, I wonder if Judas understood that Jesus knew exactly what was going on. I wonder if the traitor himself asked Jesus, is it me? And Christ turns to him and says, yes. I wonder if that moment, Judas absolutely freaks out and has to immediately leave the room. Um, because this doesn't seem like the best time to betray him, to just up and leave in the middle of their uh, dinner to go get the almost said Philistines, them too, the Pharisees to take <laughs> Jesus into captivity. Like, there was better opportunities to slip away than right in the middle of dinner when everyone's watching. But I don't see if he'd have much choice if Jesus himself looks him in the eyes and said, hey, you're going to betray me, get it over with. So the meal continues, most likely sans Judas, and just to drive home um, how much the apostles didn't really quite understand what was going on, uh, Luke 22, that one does exist, verse 24, <laughs> and there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. They are having the last supper with Jesus, he is sorrowful, he is going to his death, they are about to be betrayed, and they still want to argue over who is the best in the kingdom of God. We shouldn't judge them too harshly because we are all just as thick-headed at times as the apostles were. But this is a particularly extreme example of just not paying attention to what he's trying to tell them. So Jesus said unto them, starting in verse 25, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But he shall not be so. But he, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I among you, but I am among you as he that serveth. I was a little curious about how I would explain this, and they say a picture is worth a thousand words. So Jesse unintentionally helped me with my sermon this morning, because I'm going to use the flannel graph. Queen Esther, royalty, wife of the queen, the wife of the queen, wife of the king, one of the most powerful people in the kingdom. Very simple chair, ordinary, everyday, not a folding chair, I guess, but just an ordinary, simple wooden chair. Amen, second most powerful person in the kingdom. Same deal. Easy, ordinary, everyday chair. The actual proper king. It's a bit of a difference. Kings are uh, royalty. They are held in great esteem. They are the masters of everything they survey. They deserve the proper respect and authority and wealth and luxury that they get. The sovereign king of the universe 
did not come down and demand a big fancy chair. He came down and sit on the floor and washed people's feet. And that's what Jesus is trying to get through to the disciples here. And the rest of the New Testament would seem to indicate that he did finally get it into their heads to stop squabbling amongst each other who gets to be in charge. Because it's just a waste of energy because I'm in charge. Not Jesus is not me. I'm not whatever. Uh, verse 28. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. He's congratulating, well, kind of congratulating the disciples here, calling them his most loyal and faithful followers. <coughs> and I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father have appointed unto me. Skip to verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So Jesus says here that Simon, or Peter, has been a very specific target of Satan. The Bible says that Satan entered into Judas and caused him to betray Jesus. But he's certainly not the only apostle who has struggled with demonic forces, whether they be literal, um, as in possession, or just the influence of evil on the world. Uh, now we go to Matthew 16, verses 21 and 23. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So the title of the Last Supper is a very appropriate one because this is not really anything new for the relationship between Jesus and his disciples. He's been telling them for a while that I will have to die, and they've been ignoring him for a while. Peter in particular being brave enough to rebuke Jesus when he claimed as such. And here at the Last Supper, he's doing it again. Um, verse 33, And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day, before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. So it's the same thing between Peter and Jesus that it has always been. Peter is definitely enthusiastic enough, but that's really the problem. He's so swept up in this new movement and this Christ Savior that he's not even listening to what he's being told. This has to happen. I have to die. You cannot try to James Bond this and jump in and save me at the last second. You will deny me. You will run away. It's okay. This is what my father intended. This has been planned for long before Jesus. This has been uh, the bedrock, really, of the entire plan for the race of humanity. Um, it has been said that Isaiah is a, could be considered the fifth gospel, but the, because it talks a lot about the prophecy and coming of Jesus and what his life would be like. But there's another one hidden in the Old Testament, Genesis 22, 10 and 13. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and beheld behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. A familiar part of scripture, Abraham is commanded by God to sacrifice his son Isaac. And at the last second, when it's obvious that Abraham is going to go through with it, an angel of the Lord comes down and intervenes and offers up a ram as the replacement sacrifice. So this is a massive testimony testament 
for the faithfulness of Abraham, that he is willing to sacrifice his own son to the Lord, much like God himself was willing to sacrifice his own son for us. But at the last second, there's a replacement. The angel comes down and puts up a ram for the sacrifice instead of Isaac. Because Isaac could have been killed here, and it wouldn't have done any good. This is one of only two times I think human sacrifice was a thing for God. The other is that um, judge whose name escapes me from the book of Judges. But I'm pretty sure that one is not God's fault, to be perfectly honest. That was human stupidity in play. But I, Isaac was not sufficient, even at this young age. I, he wasn't perfect. He wasn't Jesus. There had to be something else, something more. In this case, an animal sacrifice, just to appease the sins. And for uh, thousands of years to come, animal sacrifice continues until the one perfect sacrifice of the one perfect lamb on the cross with Jesus Christ. So just kind of a preview of things to come thousands and thousands of years after Abraham's time. To get back to the Last Supper, back to Luke 22, probably for the last time, with verse 35, And Jesus said unto them, When I sent ye out without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said nothing. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. A reminder from Jesus to bring things back to the earlier scripture, 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 scripture from the book of Matthew, where Jesus just sends his disciples into town and don't worry about it, you'll find the room, I'll provide, I always provide. Here he is warning his apostles that he's not going to be with them too much awful longer. He's going to have to go. And they are going to have to rely more on swords and money and clothing and the things of the world than having the divine ruler of the universe as their best friend. And we see that throughout the rest of the New Testament. There's certainly miracles of plenty and miraculous healing and surviving ship crashes and all that kind of stuff. But there is also great persecution from the Romans and the Jews and pretty much everyone. There are hard times coming for all of the apostles. And I believe what we know of, very few of them had happy endings to their stories. Unless you count being responsible for the conversion and saving of millions upon millions upon millions of people as a happy ending, which I guess it kind of is. So it all balances out in the end. And uh, to tie in Abraham again, this is the Last Supper. Not only for Jesus, as he says here somewhere, uh, back in Mark, and he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is said for many when he gave them the cup of wine. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So this is his last meal before his crucifixion. This is the last proper Passover, <coughs> because after this it will be obsolete. The old covenants will all be done away with at the cross, and there will be no more need for it. And this will be the last uh, supper for the apostles as well, not only as a united body of 12 people, because Judas obviously ran off, <coughs> but also because they will no longer be Jews after this. They will be part of the new Christian religion with no longer a need for the Passover, though because of the culture, they most likely would continue to partake in it in years to come. But this more or less brings us to the end of the Last Supper, which is honestly where I found the most interesting um, element of this sermon. Mark, not 22, verse 26. And then when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives, which appeared to be Jesus' custom. And this is one of those things where you can, for me at least, where you can read through the Bible multiple times, um, we do that challenge in our church where about once every other year we're all challenged to read for the entire Bible. But you can read this chapter a dozen times and not really notice certain small elements. And for me, it was the hymn part. And when they had sung a hymn, 
they went out into the Mount of Olives. This scene with them having a, at least minor, worship service, which is just an unfathomably interesting thing to me. I can't really think of any other time in the scripture, there may be, there might not be, another time where Jesus sang. It's not really something we hear a lot about, which is interesting, considering how important music is to God. We are, after all, headed towards heaven, which, as the best we understand, is going to be an infinite worship choir for God and Jesus. So the fact that this is the only top place I can find that even has Jesus singing, that alone is very interesting. But it goes far beyond that. I wonder what hymn they were singing. One of the Psalms? That seems fairly likely. That's what the book was written for, after all. Psalms 24, a possibility. The Psalms we read today, Psalms 96. Could be. Psalms 100 seems a very likely choice to me. Um, I won't read it because I can't really read it without singing it. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. That yeah, um, seems a very appropriate one. I'm also interested that this isn't more talked about. Why did we keep the bush, foot washing service from the book of John and not closing our meals with a song? It may be very carnal and worldly of me, but I would much rather have a church tradition being ending our meals with a song rather than washing somebody's feet. It's petty, I know, but it'd be better in my opinion. And last but not least, it is sometimes discussed among both Christians and non-Christians alike, the idea of what would you do if Jesus came to your house for dinner? If the actual physical human being Jesus just stopped over for a beer, as I think the country song puts it, or a fine gourmet dinner, whatever it may be, what would your reaction be? What would you say? Could you even look him in the eyes? Well, I want to add another element to that this morning. What if Jesus comes to your house? What if Jesus came to your house, had dinner with you, and then wanted to sing, and then wanted to hear you have a worship song or a hymn? You've um, supped, you've talked, you've asked him a billion and one questions about evolution that aren't even relevant, and he just notices the guitar or the piano or the kazoo. Some of us are less musically talented than others in the corner and says, hey, can we do a song together? Have you ever thought about that before? What would Jesus even sound like? Would he be bass? Would he be soprano? What, what will it be like in the afterlife when we get to heaven and sing for an eternity with our Christ and Savior, Jesus the King? Just something for you to think about this morning. Pastor?